right, uh, let's get started. Uh, so today we're talking about the Phoenix framework and uh, kind of my goals for it, the features that we have so far, and where I want to see it go uh, long term. Uh, so I'm Chris McCord. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I work at a consultancy named Little Lines. And uh, yeah, we're uh, primarily a uh, Ruby shop. We do a lot of uh, Rails apps. And so the nice thing about working at a consultancy is I've gotten to work with a lot of different uh, services. Uh, we build what all web apps and web services. So I have gotten experience with a lot of different problem domains and solving a lot of different problems. So Phoenix is kind of derived from that uh, experience. I want to long term use it to replace all of my uh, client work and everything I want to build personally uh, with Elixir. So my goals are nothing short of uh, a web framework that can accomplish that. Uh, so what are we talking about today? Uh, we're talking about uh, why. Why am I doing this? Why do I think that Elixir needs a web framework? And what do I mean by web framework? And uh, kind of the main features we're going to review. Uh, we have a really nice robust routing layer. Uh, we have a nice routing DSL. Uh, something I'm super happy about is our WebSocket and PubSub layer, uh, both on the client and server. So currently we ship with a small uh, browser JavaScript dependency to wire up with our uh, real-time backend. It's about 130 lines of JavaScript. And uh, it's super nice. And we're working, my coworker is working on a, a Swift client uh, natively in iOS. So I'm super excited about that. And uh, we have plug based routers and controllers. So Jose has put together this really awesome uh, plug middleware library. Uh, so we integrate with that. So if you're not using Phoenix or if someone puts out plug middleware, it should just be able to plug right into Phoenix uh, so we can have uh, community support for uh, folks that aren't in uh, Phoenix directly. And uh, we just shipped a pre-compiled view layer recently. Uh, it's still in flux a little bit, but I'm super happy with it. Uh, it's highly performant. Everything just compiles down to function definitions. Uh, so at runtime, you're just uh, basically doing string concatenation. Uh, so it's super nice. And uh, we'll talk about the future and kind of my ambitious goals for the framework and uh, where I'd like to see um, things go long term. Uh, so why an Elixir web framework? I don't want to rehash uh, why Elixir, because I think everyone has talked about that today. Um, but I haven't heard this quote, which uh, could get me into trouble. Uh, Elixir lets me do uh, what if I could just driven development. And uh, you have to be very careful with this. Uh, so this is kind of a joke, but it's actually completely true. Uh, you have to be very careful uh, designing with this mindset. This is really just uh, API driven development or readme driven development with uh, metaprogramming on top. Uh, not everything you think of solving in this mindset actually is the correct way to do it. Uh, but for certain aspects, especially at the framework level, our goal is to make our users' uh, lives easier. Um, I've thought about developing uh, features this way. And I'll show you later how uh, some of this kind of thinking has, has brought about some, some neat features. And for me, this is the game changer, being able to say, you know, um, how can I accomplish this goal in the easiest way possible uh, in whatever domain I'm operating in? And Elixir is lets me do that um, pretty fantastically. And then the obvious cases of we have the trifecta of fault tolerance, concurrency, and distribution with metaprogramming on top. And not many languages even have the, uh, the three at the bottom. And then you put metaprogramming on top, and, uh, and it's amazing. Uh, so I think Elixir is the only language that I can build out the kind of applications I want to build today um, that I've had experience with, at least. So uh, what do I mean by web framework? And I don't know if uh, Dave's in here, but I'm not just trying to replicate Rails. So I'll just shut that down right now. Um, but I do, I do Rails full time. I really enjoy uh, the Ruby ecosystem. So some ideas have been borrowed. And I think Rails got a lot more uh, right than it got wrong. Um, but I'm not, I'm not trying to recreate a web framework that just generates HTML. I'm trying to go beyond uh, uh, what a web framework even is traditionally. Uh, so I think what we're really building is a distributed web services framework. And uh, I have hesitated to call it that because I think it might confuse folks. And I'll get into what I mean by that uh, as we go out through uh, the slides today. Uh, but I think uh, web framework today, you know, the web is more than HTML in browsers. Uh, I think the web is here to stay. I don't think the web's dying. But I think the web is evolving into what we think of uh, as the web. I think what we really need for a modern framework is a connected devices framework. Uh, we have the Internet of Things, we have iPhones, Android phones, we have smart ovens, smart toasters, and I think we have to have a framework that can connect all these things in a single backend to be able to provide some kind of service. Uh, so that's Phoenix's goal. I think if you want to just use it to render uh, HTML and serve it to a browser, it will do that uh, super well. 
but my goals are to go well beyond a framework that's just good at building uh, HTML web apps. And uh, our goals are batteries included, uh, so I'm not afraid to add features where they make sense. I think the term micro framework doesn't make a lot of sense. I think uh, libraries are great. Use libraries if you love libraries and like rolling your own code. Uh, but I think a full featured framework that has shared conventions uh, allows a community to uh, get together and, and build awesome things. Uh, so we're fo focusing on convention over configuration, uh, but with reasonable uh, um, conventions. I think most people agree with uh, what we've put together so far. Uh, I don't think we go too far with it, but great things happen if we share the same language and the same uh, conventions. Uh, third party libraries can be easily integrated, and I think uh, Rails above all things has proved that. Um, so my goal is to have a vibrant ecosystem around Phoenix and Plug and uh, be able to um, build out uh, great tooling as a community. And uh, obviously, we focus on ease of use, just like Elixir does. Uh, common tasks should be easy, and especially for me, coming from a Ruby background, um, things that are historically easy or are historically hard for me to do in Ruby, I've uh, made easy and simple in Phoenix. So uh, this is like WebSockets, uh, publishing real-time events, uh, service order and architecture. These things are actually uh, historically hard, at least coming from a Ruby environment. Uh, you think, you know, most of our uh, Languages, we think of like, okay, let's sew out, you know, service order architecture is great, microservices is a, is a hip thing to say lately, uh, but there's a lot of fanfare with other languages, right? We have to, in the Ruby world, we just split our apps up, put some REST APIs in between, and that works, or, or you know, we throw Redis in between our apps, use Redis as a bus to, to talk between the apps, and that's not a bad thing to do. Uh, so don't misquote me and say, you know, Chris McCord says JSON APIs are terrible. I think this is actually a, that's a smart way to distribute out services. But uh, with the Erlang VM and distribution, we get so almost for free, right? We send a message, it's location transparent, it could be anywhere on the cluster. Uh, so we can run an entire uh, umbrella project, uh, so to speak, and uh, we're serviced out automatically under the single code base. Uh, so I'd like to explore that with Phoenix and really focus on service oriented architecture without all the caveats of having to split our app up into RESTful APIs uh, right, out, right out of the gate. And then a little play on words here. I uh, have a goal of uh, no productivity sacrifices for performance and uh, no perfor performance sacrifices for productivity. Uh, I think Elixir gives us both. I come from a uh, Rails background where I'm incredibly productive. I love the code that I produce, but there's always this caveat of like, ah, it's kind of slow. Uh, I think with Elixir, we can get the productivity without having to make our code super dense to get performance. And we can also, in Phoenix, we want to make uh, our users super productive, but we also are focusing on making things uh, highly performant and keeping up the performance, at, not at the cost of productivity. And I think Elixir gives us both, and I've run some benchmarks, and I'm pretty happy with uh, the performance uh, so far. Uh, so enough talking, let's see some code that's hopefully large enough to read. Uh, this is our routing layer. Uh, we have a really nice routing DSL, uh, get post, put deletes, map, is gonna map out some uh, endpoints for you, and you map that to a controller. So if you had a pages controller here, that's just gonna be a module, and then we uh, refer to the action, or the function that your controller is going to uh, have in, invoked for that uh, match uh, in that controller action. Uh, so we map to a request path, to a controller, and controllers carry out some action. And then we can use this nice uh, resources macro. And if you're com coming from Rails, uh, we borrowed this. And this is gonna map out some conventional uh, RESTful endpoints. So instead of you having to map out a bunch of RESTful endpoints for a user's resource, like the list of users, uh, creating a user, updating a user, it's gonna map those out automatically. And then we can even nest uh, macros within that. And what this allows us to do is expand that at compile time to automatically build up the uh, nested uh, RESTful path with all the nice uh, parameters in the URL for you automatically. And uh, you might be thinking this is really pretty, uh, but is the code crazy? A lot of people like to rail on macros saying they hide complexity. Um, but we've st we're striving in the framework to produce macros that make sense. And uh, what happens at compile time is that module we just saw, I had to split it into two code blocks, uh, compiles to just a bunch of function definitions on a match. And uh, Jose first uh, did this in the Dynamo framework. Uh, so this is an awesome idea, so I can't claim uh, the, uh, the thought here, but I, I borrowed this in Phoenix, and, and it's super nice because at after this is compiled, we have a bunch of match definitions, and we're just relying on pattern matching to actually do 100% of the route dispatch at runtime. So this is incredibly performant because the virtual machine just takes over. We get a uh, request from the uh, web server, we split the path by a forward slash, and then we literally just call router.match, pass the uh, HTTP action in and the list of uh, split path segments. 
and then 100% of the route dispatch is handled by the Erlang virtual machine. And what we do within those match bodies is a single line of code generation. Uh, so let's say we have a macro, uh, get to some uh, path, and then we'll say we want to have some parameter on the end named slug, maybe like slash pages slash about. We want to map that to the pages controller show action. Uh, internally, that just looks like this. We generate a uh, single line of code for that function body, and then we delegate out to another module as soon as possible. Uh, so when we're writing macros, we should always be striving to generate as little code as possible, and Phoenix, I think, has uh, done a good job of that. So if you ever want to level up on your uh, macro knowledge, take a look at the code base, because uh, I'm super happy with what we've done with it. And we can see how the uh, pattern matching kind of takes over. If we get a uh, request to like get to slash pages slash about, we just split that by forward slash, and we just call router.match, and we can see that the slug uh, was matched as a variable binding, not a string. So then slug contains the string about, and then we can call a controller perform action, pass in that name parameter, and then the controller layer takes over. And the same thing, it works quite well for a uh, splat uh, named parameter. So if we have get to files asterisk path, what's going to happen there is the asterisk path means anything after uh, files, it could have uh, forward slashes in it. We want that to be the entirety of the path argument. So what we do is we generate a function that's very similar, but we use head tail pattern matching here. So if we have get to slash files, users slash Chris slash downloads, we generate a function definition named match, but if you notice we have a, we generate the AST for a uh, head tail pattern match there, and that allows us to have splat arguments and it's just a head tail pattern match on a list, which is super nice. So it's still we were able to support splat arguments at, with 100% uh, pattern match at runtime. And then we have a controller layer. And this is still in flux a little bit. Uh, I should mention that uh, if you're checking out Phoenix, check out the master branch, because I, I was hoping to have a new feature pushed out with like a dozen uh, awesome additions, but I, I didn't have time before the conference. Uh, but in master, uh, controllers are also plugs, just like the, the router is. And uh, Jose and I and the core contributors are in talks about um, being able to uh, write a macro layer on top of plug. Uh, but right now, you can just plug controllers, as like Devin showed the plug library earlier. Um, my goals with this are we can still get an explicit uh, operation on our uh, request uh, connection, um, but a really nice high level layer on top. Uh, so if you see in the controller, I can say, just start plugging uh, functions uh, to call. So at the top, I want to say when my request comes in, I want to plug authenticate. So the very first thing is I want to authenticate the connection. All that does is um, implement the plug contract that says you take a uh, uh, two arity uh, function and you return the connection. What you do within that connection or update the state is up to you. Uh, so let's say in our authenticate, we want to assign some current user. Uh, otherwise, we're going to raise an error, and it's going to halt the uh, plug stack. And then uh, if that passes, we plug action. And action is the, is the function that matches in the controller. And that's going to call our show action in the, in the pages example. And uh, you can see that you get your uh, query string parameters passed in as a map, uh, which is kind of nice. Uh, so we can pattern match directly on the query string parameters per action. So if you had specific pages, if you had pages about and you wanted to run a different function, you just define multiple, multiple function heads and you get to use pattern matching, which is super handy. And then uh, we can also call render. Uh, so the view layer landed uh, very recently lets you just call render show. So I want to re render a show template. And the nice thing about this is it's going to use the uh, request accept headers to determine what template to render. So you might have a JSON template or an HTML template. It's gonna, if you send a JSON request, it's going to send you JSON. If you send an HTML request, it's going to render HTML. And then I have, a, I have it commented out, but the nice thing with plug is it's just a list of uh, functions, a list of transformations to perform on a connection. Uh, since render in the Phoenix controller uh, takes a uh, optional third argument, it implements the, pro, the uh, plug protocol by default. You can send render a connection with a second argument. So we could, just, we could literally plug render and it would automatically render the action for us. So we get the implicit rendering uh, from the Rails side, if that's what you like, but it's still explicitly plugged in our controller. Uh, so for my goals with this, especially with functional programming, is to make the implicit explicit, but I'd like to do it not at the cost of productivity and nice APIs. So I think plug gives us that nice middle ground, and uh, Jose and I are in talks about building out a macro layer on top of plug to make this a little bit nicer. Uh, so if you check this out later, um, things could change a little bit. But ultimately, controllers and routers are plug-based. So anything that you can do in plug, you can do in Phoenix. And uh, we have uh, views and templates uh, that landed recently. Uh, this trips some people up. Uh, 
when I was first looking into this, uh, Jose told me that uh, don't call views and make views and templates different things. And I think that was fantastic advice. Um, most frameworks or web frameworks I've seen either call views templates or templates views, and they're all the same thing. Um, but in Phoenix, views and templates uh, serve different purposes. Uh, so put simply, views render templates. Uh, so templates are going to be your template source code, and views are going to actually carry out the job of rendering those templates and serve as a presentation layer for the templates. So every function you've defined in a view serves as a uh, presentation layer. So any, your templates are rendered in the context of your view modules. And we've built out a nice module hierarchy for shared context. So you could have a base view where you want to say, okay, I, I want internationalization, I want currency formatters, and you want to import those into your base view. Those are automatically going to be in the context of all sub views. And I'll show you how that works. And uh, templates are all pre-compiled into views. Uh, so there's no evaluation at runtime. It's super performant. And it's, uh, we get a really nice layer of uh, EEX and uh, Haml. For those of you that like Haml, uh, Johnny was working on uh, Calliope, and he got that in uh, just before the conference, which is super nice. Uh, so they both work. Uh, Calliope is an optional dependency, uh, but it's there. You just drop it in your project, and uh, it's super nice. And also pre-compiled. Uh, so here's a base view. This is generated for you when you run the mix Phoenix new command. Uh, we have a bootstrap project command that will generate a mix project for you. Uh, but you could write this yourself. Um, hopefully, I, I had to bump the font size down a little bit. But the nice thing about this is this serves as your uh, base application view. And you notice how we're not hiding the fact that Elixir allows us to define you know, using blocks to inject code. We just say that you define a using macro, and then you can do any kind of code injection you want to do imports, aliases, whatever you, what have you for the entire rest of the view layer. So if we want to uh, alias any module, so instead of our, with all our templates, if we all, often call out to a certain module, we can just pop that in our base view using macro, and that's injected uh, for us automatically. And then since we also import all functions for you from the uh, app.views is going to be like, you know, my app.views module. Uh, for example, if I define some new line to BR helper, it's going to split a string uh, by new line, add line breaks, but make HTML safe. Uh, I can do that here, and then that's just available automatically in all my base views. And we can see that by defining like when I said render show in that page controller, I would define by convention an app.page view. It actually should be singular page view, not pages view. We had some naming convention changes recently. Um, so if I had an app page view, I just use app.views, and then everything within the using macro is just injected for me. And that's how I get that shared module hierarchy. And then I would define my own uh, template context uh, helper functions here to serve as the presentation layer for my templates. So let's say a page view has a uh, title function that we want available to our templates, take some page struct, gives us a pretty title back. That would be available in context of all of our page templates in addition to the, the base layer. And here's a template, uh, EEX, uh, this should be pretty familiar. We can just go through and call that new line to BR. It's just automatically available in the context of the template because of that shared hierarchy. So it's really nice. And it's all pre-compiled, so it's super fast. So here's a little bit of uh, directory conventions. Uh, we have a views directory, and within that, you had a page controller. Uh, Phoenix expects a page view module. And then outside of uh, the views folder, it expects a templates directory. So if I'm rendering uh, the page view module, anything within the page directory, directory in the templates folder, all those uh, um, template sources are going to be pre-compiled into the module at compile time. So you just throw all of your templates and your page directory at compile time, it compiles them and pre-compiles them as function definitions on your view module. So at runtime, it's just a function dispatch. So I show that here. You can just go open up IEX directly, invoke pageview.render, give it a string without the template source extension, and it renders that uh, and returns you a string. And the nice thing about this is, and this is something I miss from other frameworks, is let's say I want to render JSON. I could throw a .json.eex, like a show.json.eex in my templates folder, but JSON really doesn't need to be rendered through EEX in most cases. You should just construct it as an Elixir map and return it to the client. Since our uh, view modules are just creating function definitions uh, pre-compiled at compile time, we can just define a render function within our page view. This is our page view has a bunch of render functions defined automatically for every template. But we can just use pattern matching and say, you know what, if I render index JSON, I just want to pattern match on that template name, and I'll do my own JSON encoding. Because the contract is, you just 
have a render function. It takes a uh, action name with the MIME type extension, and then it has to return a string of whatever the template is. Uh, so I see a really nice layer of Phoenix apps that have view modules uh, that are just responsible for rendering things. Some of those things may be templates, and some of those things will just be JSON or whatever you want to render directly as function definitions. So it's this really, it's this really power, it feels like this really powerful magical layer, but ultimately it's just function definitions, all name render using pattern matching. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. And now we can go over channels, which is my favorite feature. I actually think this could attract a lot of people uh, to the, la the language itself. And uh, I'm, this is why I ship channels before we ship the view layer, because notoriously doing any kind of web sockets or real time events in Ruby has been uh, very difficult. So I'm excited to see what people build with this. And, uh, channels are a WebSocket and PubSub abstraction, and they're a way to handle socket events and broadcast events. And uh, we also build in a skeleton for uh, authorization. Uh, so we don't do authorization for you, but we force you to perform authorization. Because you want, if you're doing all this broadcasting and publish subscribe, you want to be able to handle, is this person allowed to subscribe to this event? Uh, so we force you to define that. And uh, we ship with a PhoenixJS browser client it's about 130 lines of code, but it does multiplexing for you. It gives you a nice uh, socket IO style uh, API if you're familiar with that. And uh, it just works. And uh, we have a mobile iOS client. Uh, as of this weekend, I've been pestering my coworker David Stump uh, for about the last two months to build me an a iOS client, and he, uh, he finally did. Uh, so I'm super excited about that. And uh, if you're into Android, we'd love an Android client as soon as possible. Uh, Jose and I, and I have been talking about making the channel layer um, Less, it's all WebSockets right now, but maybe breaking that out to kind of any protocol and being able to do serialization to like a native Java app or, or any kind of platform. Uh, so I'm super excited about this concept and, and where it could go. And uh, just to prove that it's multi-platform, uh, I, I have my contrast, so this looks a little bit odd, but there's a Phoenix chat app in the background that's an HTML and JavaScript app using Phoenix channels. And then there's an iOS simulator in the foreground that's a native iOS uh, Swift app running uh, Phoenix channels with the same uh, channel backend. And it's, it's native, so that's not a web view on the iOS simulator. That's a native uh, Swift library implementing the Phoenix channel protocol. Uh, so I'm super excited how, where this goes. And again, this is should be revolving around connected devices, right? We have a backend that can handle my iOS app, my Android app, a browser, my toaster. You know, we have the internet of things happening. And uh, it sounds silly, but I could, for, I, foresee, I could foresee a future where I have a web front end that my uh, power company has built. I can get statistics on my home devices, and then my toaster is reporting events on a Phoenix channel, and they're all talking to each other. And that's not out of the realm of possibility, and I think we have to have frameworks that embrace the Internet of Things versus the browser of all things. Uh, so the, the channels uh, have three parts. Uh, one is at the routing layer, and uh, this, is, this is the what if I could just driven development in action here. Uh, so I had this nice HTTP routing layer where you could say git, post, put, delete, and it just worked. And I started with thinking, okay, I want to do a real-time layer with WebSockets. You know, how could I go about this? So I opened up one of my routers and kind of a prototype app, and I said, you know what? What if I could just type channel here? And that would handle um, some kind of channel name and a module to handle those events. And that's it. That's the most as I, as I had thought about it at this point. Uh, so I started here, and then I said, okay, how do I go about implementing this? Uh, so here's one case uh, where that worked really well, but again, I want to caution everyone with not everything should be uh, thought of this way. But as a framework author, we get to get away with a little bit more metaprogramming uh, than some people, so we're kind of spoiled in that regard. Um, so the only thing, other thing you have to do is just use Phoenix router socket and give it an endpoint, so it's opt-in, and uh, then it wires up the uh, WebSocket handler with the web server underneath for you. Uh, so the next part of it is a channel handler, and this is a module you define, and this is where the, we force you to handle authorization. Uh, so we always force you to define a join function that takes a socket, a topic, and some kind of message. Uh, so you can almost think of channels as uh, controllers from like a REST interface with bidirectional data flow. So channels broker requests about a particular thing. So if we had a chat room, we might have a rooms controller if it was like a REST interface we're going to have some room channel that's going to handle things about a chat room. And then the topic is going to be the thing, a specific thing on that channel we want to talk about. So this is almost would mount to like map to a RESTful ID if we're talking about controllers. 
but we went for a more general sense of just, we're talking on a channel about a particular thing and we call that topic. And uh, the biggest point with the join function is you have to return OK socket if this uh, socket is authorized to join. Otherwise, you return error socket, some kind of reason. Uh, so we force you to handle authorization, but it's up to you how you want to do that. Uh, so what would normally happen is, let's say a socket wants to join the lobby topic, which is going to be a global chat room. This doesn't require authorization since it's a global chat room. So we can um, just reply to the socket directly. We have this really nice API that says, OK, I want to reply to the socket, some kind of arbitrary message saying, hey, you've joined. Your status is now connected. And then if I want to broadcast out to anyone listening on the lobby channel, in the, on the lobby topic, I just say broadcast, give it an event, user entered, and then I can give it a map that gets serialized as JSON today. And that gets broadcasted out to 10,000 folks listening. And then I'm done. And then I can define events. So your channels are going to probably define multiple events, uh, and you just pattern match on the event name. So for a chat app, we have to be able to handle messages being posted. So I can say, OK, def events, and then I want to match on the new message event. So I match on that directly. And then I, can, I get the map as a third argument. So I can pattern match on the map uh, directly in the third argument, which is kind of nice. So I'm super happy that maps landed. That let me do that. And then all I'll do for a chat app, we don't have any database backend for this chat example, so we just rebroadcast that out. So we get a, an event new message from a single client, and then we just call broadcast. And we want to rebroadcast out, that out to anyone listening on the lobby topic. And we just forward that message along. And then we return the socket in case we updated the state. And then the third piece of this is the client. Uh, so here's our JavaScript client. So the last two slides you saw on this slide are, is a complete Phoenix chat app, other than the HTML. I'm not lying when that, that's all that's required. And then we ship with this really nice JavaScript layer where I can say, you know what, I'm going to create a new uh, Phoenix socket. And then that's going to provide me uh, some nice uh, kind of functions. So if I want to join a channel, I say I want to join the rooms channel. I give it a topic lobby. And then the third argument is going to be some JavaScript literal, and that's going to be any authorization data. And uh, for our case, we're not doing authorization, so we just pass up an empty object. But in your more realistic sense, you would pass up some kind of auth token, uh, something that you previously sent down to the client that lets them know, or that lets us know on the back end whether or not they're authenticated. And then for a chat app, we can just say, you know what, when some uh, user presses enter on their input, we just say uh, chan.send, give it a JavaScript uh, literal that maps to our back end, and that was the event you saw back here. Uh, so when I say uh, chan.send new message, I give it some arbitrary uh, JSON object, and then that's what I pick up on my back end, uh, new message event. Uh, so it's super nice. It maps back and forth really well. Uh, likewise, when I say broadcast new message here, I broadcast that to any subscribers. So the client can subscribe to channel messages by saying uh, chan.on. So chan.on is going to set up a subscription for, hey, when I receive a new message event from the channel, do something in this callback. So for our chat example, when we rebroadcast re out the message, we just append it to some DOM element, and we're done. Uh, so that's a full chat app. I think it's pretty awesome, and I think People could build games with this, Internet of Things. You could do all kinds of stuff. And I know some people today are actually building out different kind of, of games with it. So I'm super excited to see, see what happens. And uh, another neat feature, which uh, hopefully really drives home uh, what you can do with these things, is you can do PubSub from anywhere. So we could have a cluster of nodes running. And maybe we have some analytics service running. Or for a chat app example, maybe we have uh, some analytic API that's automatically a post to our chat app some kind of notice. We can do that from anywhere on the cluster and just call a channel broadcast. And then from anywhere on the cluster, that's going to say, anyone listening on the rooms channel lobby topic, here's some data for you. Uh, so you get into some really interesting cases of outside of the user operation, we could automatically be broadcasting events uh, to anyone listening. And I'll show you an example of that. So we'll see if this works. Uh, so I have a really high contrast browser window up and running here. Uh, let's see if this works. Yeah, that'll work. So this is a Phoenix chat app that we just saw uh, in the last three sides. Other than the HTML, it's exactly what you just saw. Uh, to prove that this works, I have two browser windows running. If I say Bob's over here, it works. There's Bob's message in the other tab. Let's push a, a message from an IEX shell, for example. 
Uh, so from within IEX, this could be, again, any node on the cluster. I could just say uh, I've alias phoenix.channel to channel here. I could say channel broadcast. Give it a uh, rooms channel. The topic was lobby. And again, this could be any kind of ID from a database. For a real world use case, you could have anything here that users are subscribed to. And then we give it an event, new message, and then some map. Within here, we're just going to abide by the client contract. They expect a username, so we can say this is from Phoenix. And then the message body is what the client expects. You can say, hello from IEX. It works. Awesome. So uh, and that, that showed up in the other browser. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so again, this could be from any, we could have an OTP uh, worker running crunching analytics, and then it, it receives an event, has some information, it broadcasts it out on a channel, and it just shows up to your browser, to your iPhone, to your smart toaster. Uh, so it's pretty cool. All right, so uh, let's look ahead a little bit. Uh, what do I want to look at for a Phoenix 1.0? Uh, I think we want a standard web stack with a real-time layer on top. Uh, that's there today, but I don't want to ship a 1.0 too early because I know uh, Jose and I and the core contributors have been going back and forth on uh, some specific things. So I will say by the end of the year, there will be a 1.0 release, but and I won't give any other dates before that. Um, again, we have routing controllers, views, internationalization is in place now, channels, topics. I'd like an iOS and Android client before 1.0. Uh, we have iOS that's uh, pretty close already, and then if anyone has Android experience, I'd love to put a, a Java uh, um, client in place before. And then Elixir Logger integration is a big thing for us, because if you have WebSocket crashes right now, you get a horribly unformatted uh, error uh, stack trace. So hopefully we can make that better before 1.0. And then I'd like to explore a resource protocol. I, I didn't get into uh, name routes that are generated from the router for you automatically, but I'd like to see how um, we're not going to ship a, a database model layer. I think Ecto is a great choice, um, but I'd like to see what conventions and protocols we can get in place to allow anyone to bring their own model layer in and still take advantage of being able to generate URLs for a specific um, database record or Ecto model or what have you. Uh, so before one know, I'd love to get something like that in place. And then a huge focus for myself is uh, comprehensive guides. Uh, I think uh, I've registered phoenixframework.org. It's not up yet. Um, this has already been an issue. Um, folks are really interested and they want to get involved, but our documentation uh, needs some work and we need to focus on the onboarding process. Uh, so for the next couple months, uh, one of my big focuses is going to get guides together, whether it's in text form. I think video form works really well for some people, so I'd, like to, I'd love to put together some videos on how do you build a chat app, which I have a video of that uh, today, but I'd love to get guides in place. So if you'd like to get involved, we could use guide contributions. And uh, let's look at uh, beyond Phoenix 1.0. And uh, I have some ambitious goals here, and I'd love feedback especially. Uh, I'd like to focus on uh, distributed services and uh, service and node discovery for a Phoenix application on some cluster. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Uh, this is inspired by React Core, and uh, essentially it would be a toolkit for easily building fault-tolerant services that scale. Uh, I don't mean, just mean to say that as like a web scale term. I think uh, the Erlang Virtual Machine uh, and supervision gives us all these great facilities, but we don't really have any awesome framework for building uh, distributed services out and being able to run um, uh, things in a manner that almost uh, transparently scale for you. And uh, this is eventually, I'd like it to be a decentralized masterless service registration, uh, but I think it would probably start out as a master slave setup uh, like our topic layer, because uh, uh, React Core is doing, uh, I think uh, we saw earlier, a uh, process ring uh, where they do uh, consistent hashing. Uh, they've solved some really um, hard problems, and I th think I'd like to go that direction eventually, uh, but I'd like to start simple. And I'll show you some pseudocode, what I mean, uh, by what I'd like to accomplish. Uh, so Phoenix service, what is that going to do? Well, I want to be able to spin up a Phoenix node, and I want that node to advertise on the cluster saying, hey, I can perform some work, and these are the things I can do. Uh, so we're going to review kind of a, let's say we're building a search engine in Phoenix. We want to be able to run a couple services like uh, page crawling and page indexing. Uh, but those are going to be expensive operations, and we want that to be fault tolerant and also scale out. So I'd like to be able to perform something like this. And I don't want to trivialize this process or what the amount of work that this will take to solve correctly, but this is ultimately what I, what I want to accomplish. So I want to say anytime we have like a node up or a node down, 
I want, uh, first of all, I want when you spin your Phoenix app up, I want to be able to configure a node list for your different environments. So I start a Phoenix node and it's going to automatically find the first node it can connect to and join the cluster. And then uh, notice how we, today you can say mix Phoenix start to start your application router. I didn't name that mix Phoenix server uh, specifically because I wanted to get into this idea of just starting things uh, with our Phoenix app. So I want to be able to start mix Phoenix start page crawler page indexer on some node saying I want this node to say hey I can crawl pages I can index pages and that's going to register itself on the cluster let all let the all the other nodes know the kind of work I can perform and what this gives you is this gives you fault tolerance and scalability and I'll show you the API uh, that I want to do this with uh, so I kind of want this to happen uh, transparently for you so this is pseudocode this doesn't this is just hopefully to kind of drive the message across I want to be able to say def module page crawler use Phoenix service and then define some commands that my servers can perform. So for the page crawler case, I receive a crawl command to crawl a page. And I want, to be able, I want the service to be able to say, you know what, maybe it's busy or maybe it can perform some work. So let's say we have this status function that can take the service's state. And for a page crawler, maybe we can only do 1,000 page crawls at once before we've maxed out IO resources. So this service can say, get your status and perform the crawl. And if your status is busy, so if you've implemented some business logic to say, I have a thousand page crawls going right now, I'm busy, I want to be able to say, you know what, reply to the caller and say, you know, I'm busy right now, but try the next service. So you'd be running multiple page crawlers on the, on the cluster, and you could return a response saying, you know what, I'm up, I'm online, but hey, try the next one, because I can't respond. Otherwise, you can just delegate out to some OTP process, OTP worker, a module saying, hey, fetch this page, and then reply, okay, here's the page content. Otherwise, there was some error fetching from the host. And then the great thing in, in user land where the client calls this is I want to be able to do something like this. I want to be able to say, okay, I want to call a page, so service.call, here's the service page crawler, and then here's the command I want to send to it. And I, that, what that would do is it would have a node registry saying, find a node on the cluster that could perform that page crawl and do the work for me. And you could get, so let, let's, let's kind of see how this would work. Let's say it hits the first node and the node says, hey, I'm here, but I'm busy. Please try the next one. That service would automatically, for you, find the next node that could do it. That might say it's busy. And let's say the third one running says, okay, here's the page. It would return the page back to you, and you're done. So I want the service, uh, it would find the service for you and also handle busy cases or handoffs uh, transparently. So all you do in user land is call service call, page crawler. It's going to find a node that can do it and give you a result. You don't care internally on which one it routed to, which ones were busy. You just care about what you get back and that the work was performed. Uh, so ultimately, you would get your fault tolerance because you're going to run these on multiple nodes and you get scalability. If you know that you can do 1,000 page crawls on a node before you max out the I.O. resources, run 10 of those and now you've put, you've 10, 10 times increased your throughput. Uh, so for my goal, my goal for this is to make uh, distributed services and applications incredibly easy. And this is something I think that is lacking in the ecosystem right now. And if you have experience with this, uh, let me know. But I think long, long term, I want someone to be able to bootstrap a Phoenix app with Phoenix new command and be running a distributed Phoenix application on multiple nodes in 15 minutes. And I think that would, that would let us do that. Uh, so that's all I have for today. Please let me know your thoughts. And uh, let's build a future. I think that's, all, that's why we're all here. And I'd love to build things that I currently can't build uh, with Elixir. So thanks a lot. I noticed in the example code that you have to explicitly HTML safe strings. So when Rails added that, that cut down a lot on the risk of cross-site scripting. So yes, so um, your, your EX templates, thanks to Eric, are automatically safe for you. Uh, so let me bring up a template example. So like in this, uh, I don't have an example here. Any, anytime you would do the interpolated elixir equals there, that would automatically return a safe string, escape for you automatically. But so you don't have to worry about it. The HTML safe system in Rails also annotates that the string is already HTML safe, so you don't get double escaping. How do you handle that? So the escaping is going to actually be a tuple of uh, this string is safe. So it's going to be a tag tuple of safe value. And if it's a raw string, it's just going to be a raw string. So, so it's a record? Because that's a tag tuple. It's actually just a tag tuple. Okay. Tag tuple as in? The first uh, element's an atom, and the second thing is your value. Okay. And then um, 
you, you kept saying contract. Do you have um, thing uh, stuff for uh, EX unit where you can use them to check that your stuff follows the contract? Yeah, so by contract, I just mean plugs contract is you give it a connection and optional argument, and it returns you the connection back. Okay, so there's no test helpers to ensure that the code is doing that, though. Yeah, you would just write, so plug ships with a uh, test helper library, so you can create a connection, pass it through that specific function, and then write whatever unit test you want around that. Okay. So whatever the, you inspect the connection after you call the plug, and then you made some assign or redirect it or do whatever you would just test that as you would test anything else. Uh, this is awesome, by the way. Thank Looks you. great. Um, so you were talking about uh, automatically service, uh, automatic service discovery. Yep. Um, I silently open source something that does exactly that. Um, okay. I silently did so because I've only used it in production for about three weeks. Um, okay. Awesome. But um, yeah, all the node. It's called Discovery. It's on GitHub under Undead Labs' GitHub account, um, and uh, basically. Um, all the nodes connect is hidden, so they're not fully meshed. It allows you to create distributed um, federations. Um, awesome. And then the messaging layer is not part of it yet, um, but it puts all the services in a consistent hash ring, and it auto-connects OTP nodes together, so you might be able to leverage it. Yep. Uh, and then the distributed transaction system isn't in there yet, um, but it exists in my project or set of projects. Um, so we might be able to put that in there as another library that you could, you could leverage that. Yeah, yeah, find me after talk because that sounds like exactly what I want to accomplish. So yeah, it's cool. awesome. So, Chris, um, how's it looking for the community for adding uh, extra or uh, packages in here uh, compared to Rails for authorization, authentication, active admin, all that stuff? Are you are you currently building a community around that? Is there any work other than the framework? Yeah. So, so my goal is long term are to have a entire community around Phoenix. You know, I, I want to create a fiber ecosystem around it, and I think being plug-based will help us get there. So if you're familiar with like Warden from Rack in the Ruby world, um, someone can implement a plug middleware for authentication, and we could just plug it up into Phoenix. Uh, so I see a vi very vibrant ecosystem with uh, plug itself and then also Phoenix, uh, because we'll have a set of shared conventions that will let people do some little bit of metaprogramming if you want to throw in a module, and it could just hook into our, our own uh, conventions. Because uh, you know, I see one of the biggest barriers right now to you know actually starting to develop uh, production uh, applications is with all this extra stuff that you'd get with uh, with Rails. So, actually, I guess I'm talking to the community here. So, you know, I think if we had the community out building this stuff, to, to you know, things would uh, we'd get an adoption a lot quicker. So. Yeah, I mean, that's the goal. As fast as I can replace my Rails development with Phoenix, um, I'll do everything I can for that. Cool. So I currently have like tendonitis in my elbows and wrists for the amount of typing I've been doing uh, well, to make that happen. So. I wasn't trying to lean on you. I was actually trying <laughs> I to. I know. Lean. I'm just saying that <laughs> my goal is, you know, th this is, my goal is to do the uh, coding in Elixir 100% of my time for both work and play. So cool. as fast as I can make that happen and grow a community to help me do that, um, that's what I'm focusing on. So. Yay, Elixir. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you.